to get through and members are arriving as you know on Monday morning and they're watching in their offices I heard as well so it, uh, we will have a, a greater attendance in a little bit so maybe we will begin and I may have to step out and go and vote in that appropriations committee for a minute and then uh, come right back if, unless someone else is here to, to take over so very good so thank you um, and good afternoon Thank you all for coming to today's informational hearing of the Senate Committee on Business Professions and Economic Development. I promised last year to convene a discussion to explore the corporate practice of medicine doctrine outside of a bill hearing. We are here today to examine what the CPM doctrine is about, how it evolved, and whether, it is still, whether it's still appropriate for healthcare today. The California Research Bureau published an excellent report on this topic, which will help guide us in our discussion. Both this report, as well as the Research Bureau's 2007 report on the corporate practice of medicine, are available on this committee's website. Because the healthcare market has changed so significantly since the inception of California's ban on CPM, it is unclear whether the ban is still achieving its original purpose. The ban was established in the early days of medicine to prohibit an employer's interest from coming between a doctor and his patient. Now, however, there are health insurers, malpractice insurers, pharmaceutical corporations, and pharmacy benefit managers' interests coming between a doctor and a patient today. These gatekeepers mean that corporations are essentially already practicing medicine. The legislature must consider whether to streamline the system by integrating all health care providers, preserve the status quo, or consider alternatives that better serve the needs of both health care providers and patients. California consumers deserve a health care system that is designed with their best interests in mind. I'd like to welcome our first panel, if we could, uh, to give us an overview of this topic. Ann Neville is the director of the California Research Bureau, and please, if you would, thank you. And Kitty Juniper is an attorney with Bookhalter, Bookhalter Niemer, PC. Is that, was I correct on that? Hopefully I was close enough. Great, okay, welcome, and thank you so much for coming today, and uh, thank you for your research on, on this, this topic. And I went through your the 2007 research, and interesting, a lot of similarities came up. In. Good afternoon. My name is Anne Neville, and I am the director of the California Research Bureau, a division of the California State Library. I'd like to thank Chairman Hill and Vice Chairwoman Bates and fellow members of the Senate Business, Professions, and Economic Development Committee for inviting us here to speak today. As members of this committee are aware, the Bureau provides nonpartisan independent research and analysis to members of the legislature, governor, and other constitutional officers. Our team of librarians and researchers act as shared staff for you, providing background information on policy issues, gathering and analyzing data, and conducting in-depth research. Research we conduct on behalf of our library patrons is confidential unless requested otherwise. I'm here today, as you know, to discuss one such piece of research that falls in that otherwise category. Last fall, this committee requested that we research the corporate practice of medicine doctrine, particularly in light of the changes in healthcare since we last investigated the issue in 2007. At the request of the committee, we've made the report containing this research public, and as you mentioned, it's on your website and it's also available on our website. So today, I will focus on several areas of the report. What is the ban? How more or less similar to other states are California's practices? And how effective is the ban in meeting its goals? The corporate practice of medicine ban is exactly that. It prevents corporations from practicing medicine. As stated by the Medical Board of California, the policy is intended to prevent unlicensed persons from interfering with or influencing the physician's professional judgment. Since its inception, this has been interpreted to mean that corporations may not employ physicians. Historically, the corporate practice of medicine and its counterpart, the corporate practice of dentistry, was intended to prevent uh, pre employers who were presumably guided by profit-making or other non-medical interests from compromising the care that a physician or dentist might provide to his or her patients. And there will not be a lot of history today, but a little bit to give us context of where we've come. So 
By the late 1920s, California and much of the rest of the country had enacted state level laws. In California, a 1932 court case. Ms. Neville, may I yeah. ask you? I do have to go yeah. upstairs for one minute. I apologize for that. So, and I will be right back okay. in a minute or two. So that works. We'll just holding it for a moment? Yeah, no, no yeah, problem. Would that be all right to, to hold yeah. it until we, if we had another member here, we would do that. So I'll just uh, <laughs> recess the hearing for a second, a minute or two, and we'll be right back. is a, actually a picture of a, a colorful dentist named Painless Parker. Um, the necklace around his neck is actually a set of teeth that he extracted. Yes, I know. Um, and uh, he, there was a court case that revolved around him. He promised uh, his patients a painless trip to the dentist, uh, and he often provided them with a syringe of water mixed with cocaine, uh, and hired a showman from P.T. Barnum's Circus to help him with marketing. Um, but he is, uh, uh, his court case is the reason that we have a sort of underlying, uh, 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 it, underlying difference on w what it was that the court thought the, a, a person could do versus a corporation. So the, uh, in that case, the court said, the state's licensee shall possess consciousness, learning, skill, and good moral character all of which are individual characteristics and none of which is an attribute of an artificial corporation. Up until the 1950s, the ban continued to gain strength in most states. The reasons were very clear then. Industries like mining employed doctors based typically on friendships and financial arrangements and not on professional expertise. Uh, the result, according to a 1947 public uh, federal report, was minimal public health in mining areas and inordinately high rates of infant mortality. So beginning uh, in the late 1960s, however, California and a number of other states began to make exemptions to the ban. Uh, and this was reflective of the, what was beginning to change in the healthcare marketplace at that time. Uh, so, listed uh, on the screen are all of the exemptions to the ban today. Uh, the Research Bureau's 2007 report put forward the idea that the ban may have actually just simply been eroded uh, because of the significant number of exemptions to it. And there are, there are quite a few, as you can see. Uh, as in all other states for which we could find information, professional medical corporations are exempt from the ban. So professional medical corporations vary in size, uh, they are for-profit enterprises within which physicians or other licensed professional service shareholders, officers, directors, or professional employees. In addition, certain primarily nonprofit or government entities are exempt, including the UC Health System and California's three private medical schools, nonprofit community clinics, county hospitals, state agencies, nonprofit research clinics, narcotic treatment programs, specialty pediatric hospitals, and HMOs. In addition, there is um, an exemption for certain charitable institutions uh, and foundations, uh, but we uh, found through the medical board that they had never actually made an exemption for that. Uh, additionally, uh, between 2003 and 2011, California had a pilot program in place to allow hospitals owned by hospital districts to employ physicians. Uh, during the pilot program, legislators introduced nine different bills to extend the program, and the legislature did not at that time, and I think as uh, many people in the room are aware today, there is, now, uh, there is a currently a bill uh, going through the legislature to reinstate that program. So, Excluding most professional corporations for which we could not find statistics, we estimate that at least 30% uh, of practicing physicians in California are employed through exemptions to the corporate practice of medicine ban. Um, this is likely higher, um, but based on the numbers that we have, uh, this, was, this is the, the baseline. So that's about 21,000, uh, 21, there are approximately 71,000 active physicians practicing in California. Um, the number does include Kaiser Permanente. Uh, many people think of Kaiser as an HMO that directly employs its physicians. It actually uses what is called a group model. Uh, and in that, physicians are employed by the medical corporation, which provides services to Kaiser plan members on an exclusive basis. So for context, 
um, there are uh, approximately 45% of physicians in California that are in solo or small partnerships, small partnerships being defined as two to nine uh, physicians. Uh, and I do note this is from a 2015 uh, UC San Francisco study uh, with a 95% confidence interval, so that's why the little tilde in the front. Um, so actually, before I go on, let me make a note about nonprofit hospitals because that tends to come up in much of the literature around the corporate practice of medicine here and in other states. Uh, so a number of other states have created exemptions for nonprofit hospitals, uh, and we discuss it in the report. Uh, there is significant variation uh, across nonprofit hospitals in terms of how they act, the amount of charity uh, care that they provide, uh, and, uh, and other activities. So some nonprofit hospitals appear to act more like for-profit hospitals and vice versa. Uh, and some nonprofit hospitals have high levels of patient care and others do not. So uh, what we are saying here and what we uh, mentioned in the report is that nonprofit status is not in and of itself what we think is the key determinant to understanding whether hospital physician employment could result in undue pressure on a physician's medical decisions. So California compared to the nation. Uh, we found that much of the national data unfortunately created as many questions as it answered. Um, we do know that half of states have laws that clearly prohibit the corporate practice of medicine. Each state has its own exemptions and some of them are, are have many more on the list than California does. Um, and each state has uh, its own structures in terms of how it actually enforces the corporate practice of medicine. Um, unlike California, just over half of states allow hospitals to employ physicians. Um, two of the states that had very stringent uh, corporate practice of medicine bans in 2007 uh, Ohio and Texas have lessened them significantly since that time. Ohio, as we understand, is pretty much no longer active, and Texas has more exemptions for hospitals. On the other hand, uh, Minnesota and Massachusetts have both uh, strengthened their bans. So this really leads us to the third question. Is the ban meeting its goals? And uh, I thought for this to start with the uh, the goal of the ban. And uh, in Physician Services versus Aoki Diabetes Research Institute, the court said it is meant to protect patients. Um, and I think that is uh, when we look at kind of the bottom line of whether it is meeting its goals, that's, uh, that's where, it's, uh, where it starts. So the ban does this by preserving the independent medical judgment of physicians, or it should do that by preserving the independent medical judgment of physicians. Employment can clearly create a conflict of interest, and as we discuss in our paper, physicians also face a number of other potential conflicts of interest. These are important as we take into account how much the ban is able to protect uh, patients. So while preventing direct employment, the law, the law does allow alignment strategies, and this allows physicians and hospitals to work together. Uh, it can happen at an individual level, certainly, uh, but uh, it is m often happening at a group level uh, where you have a professional medical corporation and you have a hospital and, um, and they have an, uh, they're using an alignment strategy to be able to work together and that is more efficient for, for both groups participating. Um, one of the primary strategies um, where, that there is a fair amount of literature on are medical foundations. Uh, foundations act as an intermediary between physicians or medical groups and a hospital. So Dignity Health Medical Foundation, for, exam uh, for example, works with the Dignity Health Medical Group. Uh, other alignment strategies include uh, hospital outpatient departments and hospital purchasing, hospitals purchasing medical practices, and I'll talk about the latter uh, in a little bit. In all of these cases, the physician or physician group employs a professional services agreement with the hospital. The strategies are often complex, and they do requ require a large base of physicians, making it difficult for hospitals with fewer finances and rural hospitals to use them. When put into place, however, the alignment strategies generally appear to work, supporting the independent medical judgment of a physician, though this is not always the case. Uh, a recent example from Dignity Health uh, illuminates this. So last fall, uh, a pregnant woman in Reading wished to have a tubal ligation after she gave birth to her third child. Her doctor agreed. 
The hospital where she was to give birth disagreed on religious grounds and prohibited her doctor from performing the procedure. The ACLU sued in December of 2015, arguing that dignity had violated a number of state laws, including the ban on the corporate practice of medicine. In this case, the fact that the hospital could not employ the physician did not stop it from limiting what procedures the physician could perform in its hospital. The fact that the ban is in place, however, provided another avenue by which the patient could seek recourse through the courts. We also find a potentially disconcerting trend when a hospital owns a practice. Recent research demonstrates that in these cases, the physician's patient is substantially more likely to choose the owner hospital, even when other hospitals have lower costs and higher quality. If a physician's practice is not owned uh, by a hospital, patients tend to choose the opposite, less expensive, higher quality hospitals. The challenge here is that the research does not explain why this is happening. It could be the result of reimbursement rates. It could be that physicians like and recommend their owner hospitals. It could be undue pressure from the owner hospital. What we know is that there is a result and that the result does not appear to benefit the patient. These two cases point to a larger question. Do pressures other than employment bias physician decision making in today's complex healthcare system? And you uh, uh, referred to that in your, in your opening statement. Uh, we think this is an important question because much of the existing discussion around the corporate practice of medicine examines only the physician employee scenario. There is an abundance of literature that specifically examines financial conflict of interest. And here, few if any ever mention the corporate practice of medicine. Researchers point to three types of conflicts. Self-referrals for okay. office services and physician-owned centers, government and private insurer incentives and reimbursement models, including employee salaries and bonuses, and quote unquote, the largesse provided by the drug and device industries, and I apologize for the typo there. Um, the research findings demonstrate that all of these scenarios create, quote, financial relationships that bias physician decisions to different degrees. For example, physician-owned specialty hospitals, which specialize in cardiac, orthopedic, or other highly profitable surgical procedures, appear to overutilize certain services as a result of self-referral. The emergence of these hospitals appears to be at least partially the result of declining physician salaries and a compelling need for greater autonomy in their practices than they had in their relationships with community hospitals. The federal government was concerned enough about the practices in these cases that it limited their growth as part of the Affordable Care Act. However, and importantly, patient satisfaction at these hospitals is generally high, and in some cases higher than at competitor full-service community hospitals. This may reflect that specialty hospitals often serve more lucrative and healthier patients, that overutilization of services results in patients who feel like they received better care, uh, even if it wasn't always necessary, or that these hospitals simply provided better care. What we have are the results. We don't always have exactly why these are happening. In looking at the impact of insurer incentives, one report demonstrated how the patients of physicians who held capitated or fixed price per co patient contracts with insurance companies were admitted to lower cost hospitals that were farther away, ostensibly responding to the financial incentive of a, a capitated contract. However, researchers did not find either decreased patient health outcomes or decreased quality of care. The movement by private and government insurers to pay for quality of care rather than quantity as, a fee, as the fee-for-service models once did may continue creating opportunities that provide the needed financial reimbursement for, for physicians while elevating patient care. However, the research at this point is still limited in its ability to demonstrate that the pay for performance programs are working on a large scale. So I want to be clear that the literature does not conclude that financial incentives are driving physicians' decisions, but, they, but it does conclude that they play a role alongside patient needs and other factors. Sometimes the outcomes don't impact Patient, uh, patient health, and sometimes they do. While professional codes of ethics are robust and commitment to evidence-based practices is standard, as one researcher explained, quote, such considerations can sometimes have a paradoxical effect, causing physicians to be overconfident in their own immunities. 
This appeared to be particularly clear in the research surrounding pharmaceutical sales, with many physicians reporting that they did not think that they changed their habits as a result of pharmaceutical representatives providing free samples or offering continuing education <clears throat> training when physicians often did. So how do physicians view their own autonomy? A 2014 report reviewed national longitudinal data between 1996 and 2005. It found that physicians in larger practices reported less autonomy in logistic-based decisions. So these are described by feeling that they had adequate time to spend with patients. And that's probably um, it's not all, of, all that surprising um, in a larger organization. Uh, but what became very interesting was that at, uh, when, talk, when looking at knowledge-based autonomy, which is uh, the kind of autonomy that requires special knowledge, so knowledge that you only get through training, small practices actually reported uh, less autonomy. Physicians in larger practices reported more autonomy than those in smaller practices. And that was, that was surprising to the authors of the study. Um, they surmise that small practices may not be able to keep financial and clinical <coughs> considerations separate due to their decreasing share of the healthcare market uh, and pressure from managed care participation. Uh, one important point related to the corporate practice of medicine here, the study did not find an association between salaried status and reports of freedom in clinical decision making. So uh, physicians who were salaried did not report that they were more, felt more or less autonomous compared to those physicians who were not salaried. This is um, unfortunately the only report we found that investigated this aspect of employment. It is something that is not widely available in research. So it is, I'm sure, no surprise to this committee that conflicts of interest exist and that various external pressures, such as insurers and managed care environments, affect physicians' own view of their autonomy. The question is how these issues relate to California's law barring the corporate practice of employment, of medicine. One researcher suggests adopting a conceptual model that would reflect both, quote unquote, the vulnerability and compromise judgment on the part of both the patient and the provider, thereby creating policies that would protect both groups. At the edges of this debate, there are really two options. One could eliminate the employment ban, replacing it with language that prohibits non-medical intervention in a physician's decision, as are often found in contractual relationships or contracts. Um, or when the legislature could keep the existing ban and strengthen it by eliminating exemptions or uh, increasing penalties. Within these contours, we suggest a number of other options for the legislature to consider as well develop a consistent policy by which to measure exemptions, <clears throat> assess how the changing incentive structure will impact physicians, hospitals, and insurers, and increase patient access to data about physician-hospital relationships and hospital quality care metrics. Researchers always say this, and I also feel the need to say it here. There is still much research that hasn't been conducted, and it would be very helpful to this conversation, um, but is all of you know policy is often made without the benefit of every bit of possible research that could be done. Um, we could not find research more than anecdotal stories that demonstrates whether other methods of protecting physician autonomy are, uh, are sufficient. Uh, what we can say is that we found an absence of them. Uh, so in, in areas where, uh, in areas, uh, where there, where employment is available here, we, we didn't find any, uh, research that said this is a huge and ongoing problem. No, that's good. Um, and, uh, at a more basic level, we do not know the full number of physicians that are exempted by the ban, uh, or how differently professional medical corporations act than other employers. And we don't know how changing employment restrictions would impact the negotiating ability for fair reimbursements for providers by insurers. As you mentioned in your opening statement, there are many different players today, and changing the dynamics of those relationships will also change all these other facets of, of the environment. So with that, I'd like to close and say thank you again for the opportunity to conduct this research uh, and to be here today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hey, thank you, Ms. Neville. Appreciate it. And, and thank you for the extensive work on the uh, 
and the analysis uh, in the in the report it uh, it really is quite comprehensive as I read through it over the weekend and, and looked at it before it's uh, very thorough and addresses a lot of issues one of the questions though is and and it may be tough and with all of the information but based on your research what is the best evidence for keeping the ban as you can see I think the best evidence for keeping the ban is that the system appears to generally be working today. There are a number of workarounds. Those workarounds are legal, and physicians and hospitals have generally figured out how to make those work. There are certainly exceptions, um, but in general, the, the system does seem the, the system does seem to be to be working at, at some level. So I think that is the I mean that's the, the strongest argument is that um, is that it's not falling not falling apart uh, in front of our eyes. It's working. Is that based on the number of exemptions that have been allowed to accommodate for unique cir circumstances around the state? Is that how you would look at it, or? I would look at it more uh, because of the workarounds, um, medical foundations, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, hospitals working directly with clinics or buying physician practices. Uh, those are, uh, and also uh, accountable care organizations uh, that uh, uh, were, are organizations that are intended to increase efficiencies and increase the quality of care in an integrated healthcare system. Uh, there are ACOs uh, working in California. The, the most integrated approach would probably be an employment approach, um, but they have found ways to work together, not including employment. And, and almost the same, if you look at the Kaiser model that you mentioned before, that seems to be almost I mean, it's a workaround is what it is, it's what, what they were successfully able. So, and then what would be the best evidence for repealing the ban? So, I think that the best evidence for, the best evidence for repealing the ban is, <laughs> is going to be understand, well, I guess I would begin by saying that we didn't find evidence that uh, physicians who were in employment uh, in other in other states, who in, uh, or through the exemptions in California, were acting in a less ethical manner uh, than were physicians here. Uh, now, that's the right. It's always trying to prove the absence of, um, but. We, we found we found nothing. We certainly found anecdotal stories, um, and I think those are those are always available. And that's typically why you have laws preventing you know you, laws preventing things like the Stark and the anti kickback laws and things like that, right? To prevent unethical activity. Um, so I, I mean the it, I I don't think it's particularly clear why uh, the Employment itself versus having uh, having contractual obligations that have a a do not interfere clause in them. What that what that difference would be? There's certainly there's a bigger difference with employee with employment, um, but it also uh, but it's the research just isn't very clear that there's uh, that how wide how wide that is. Um, and I guess I would say that it does seem like there are. So many other players who have uh, who have power in the marketplace, uh, particularly insurers, um, whether uh, physicians are going to be able to uh, uh, to participate in a network. Um, there's lots of discussion about narrow networks and and the impact that has on consumers. Uh, and those are all. I mean, in in some ways, those those could have the same impact on a on a consumer, uh, right? But there are state laws. That prevent it. There are state laws that prevent saying that a uh, not allowing a physician to be uh, not allowing a physician to be part of a network uh, for uh, uh, for sort of ancillary uh, reasons. So I, I think that is that question is you know can we just simply have a law on the books or does it have to be an actual ban? And and I think those are that's I mean that's really the the challenge you know the the challenge that's there and you know we find that. It's uh, just about half the country allows it, and just about half the country doesn't. And, and I think you you raised the issue that uh, that I think is, is is critical. I mean, I always look at physicians as being very ethical, and they're they have a ethical code that they live with and work with. Um, 
and some will violate that code, some will, most will not, um, and whether it's in a corporate setting or whether it's not in a corporate setting, and I think that's what you've seen through the research with the other states that haven't been involved. There are some that will, will fall with that and some that will not. So it doesn't look, uh, seem to show that one particular form or the CPM is, is the driver of that, I guess, of that ethical standard and ethical behavior. 